Well, surprise, surprise. We get a reading this morning, a story about a divided church. Division. We've been reading about it a lot these days, months, years, it seems. It's present in our politics most profoundly, but it can be present in our families. It can be present in our churches. Some churches report being split by red and blue, like the country. Not ours, thank God, but that is a report. Years ago, there were many divisions in the church that I remember. A new prayer book, oh Lord, remember that one? <laughs> Women clergy, a freestanding altar. Mm. The church in Ephesus seems to be divided down the middle over a centuries-old split between Jew and Gentile. Imagine the shock of going to church and finding there in your church, in your presence, maybe beside you in the pew, one with whom you and your tribe have been at war for centuries. Down through the ages, Gentiles had rejected Israel, if you will, fought against them. Jews had fought for their survival, so to say, against this tyranny, if you will, and suffered greatly. Gentiles looked down upon Jews for their refusal to worship the Roman gods, and conversely, Jews looked down upon Gentiles because they would be unclean. So think of the jolt of walking into the church in Ephesus and seeing these others, these aliens there in your church, proclaiming Jesus and his love and his salvation. We cannot understand the gravity of this challenge that the early church faced. We think these things only exist in our time. But just think, Jesus is not only the Messiah and Savior of Israel, but also of these Gentiles. Is that what you really want me to believe? It's one thing to believe Jesus was the Savior of us, but also of them. So Ephesians may have a word for us today especially as we are experiencing in our own culture and in our own nation, what seems to be not just a concerted effort, but a well-organized machine to manufacture reasons for us to be divided. Leaders, political and otherwise, left and right, seem to be in a place where they're looking for success by division. That their pathway to keeping power seems to be found in focusing on division, not on unity. It's an age-old strategy. Yet like never before in my own history are we seeing it. Being tempted to evaluate each other, not on the basis of their humanity, but on the basis of their political view or social view or nationality or religious practice. We seem to be being encouraged to find our differences always rather than our commonality. Of course, the shadow side of division is now as it was in Jesus' day. Violence, destruction, and death. There are well-documented outbursts in our own culture against Asian Americans and Jews and Latinos 
Now, I know that those who do not claim a religious faith can find a way to counteract this type of philosophy of division by pointing to common humanity, a good place to point. But we, disciples of Jesus, have additional resources. We come here today and we hear of the Ephesian church to be reminded that as disciples of Jesus, we reject a politics of division and division as a way of life. As disciples of Jesus, it's not that we reject political debate, negotiation, diplomacy, Indeed, politics demands tough debate, tough negotiation, tough diplomacy. We reject evaluating each other on those terms. I can only imagine what a vestry meeting for the Ephesus church looked like. <laughs> I don't envy it. I've got it made based. <laughs> I can imagine them trying to decide at breakfast on Sunday morning, bacon or no bacon. <laughs> no, what we reject as followers of Jesus is division grounded in things like religious perspective, or political party, or national origin, or gender, or the like. Now, this isn't some affirmative action list. This is real. The Ephesians followed, I'm sure, customary roles of life for men and women and others. I know they did. But the author of this letter wants all disciples to see that God no longer sees us according to to anything besides God's love. In the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he says here, something has changed about humanity. It's a cosmic shift, and I mean that. In the resurrection of Jesus, the cosmic order has changed. When God looks upon human beings, suggests the author, God no longer sees according to Jew or Gentile or the nation we were born in or the political party we are a part of or even religious cares. Christ is beyond religion. Christ calls all the religious to unity in his name. God, says the author of Ephesians, when God looks upon these Jews and Gentiles, he sees one new humanity. This is truly a cosmic change. Not a change that we made happen, but one that God has made happen. In Christ, our view of our neighbor cannot be as the other, the foreigner, the outsider, because, he, the author says, God has brought us near to each other. God has made us one. The clear implication of this Ephesian claim is that any belief is, is, is that I, I cannot hold to some belief that I am more worthy of God's love than anyone else. My wealth, my family position, my skin color, my eye color, my gender, whatever it might, might be, doesn't give me a leg up with God anymore. The cosmic order has shifted. For disciples, this is not a political assertion or philosophy. 
It's simply declaring the character of God. The character of God is that all creation is God's and falls under God's love and care. This is what God does in Jesus. He reconciles people. This is Jesus' purpose. This is why he was born. This is why he lived. This is why he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven to reconcile the world to himself and us to each other, to create a new kingdom. Perhaps the most important implication of this cosmic shift is that we are called to see with the eyes of God. Now, none of this takes away the truth that many decisions still need to be made among us. Decisions we face as a church, as a city and as a nation, our unity in Christ doesn't take away the complexity of life. Say the complexity of an immigration policy. It's still very complex. Or a healthcare policy. It's still very complex. Or God forbid the suggestion that now we need another revision of the Book of Common Prayer. I'm a delegate to the church's general convention next year and I'm dead set against it. (laughs) No. Christ's power of reconciliation doesn't remove the complexities of life. It still requires our reason. It still requires our discernment. It still requires our need to debate, to negotiate, and to make decisions that are right for all. But it does mean that in these challenges, I do not look upon my neighbor as a liberal or a conservative, a Democrat or a Republican, an Asian or a Latino or a foreigner, a high churchman or a low churchman, because by God's power, I am called to see my neighbor first and foremost as a child of our Heavenly Father. This is a call to reject the spirit of division. This passage, this book of Ephesians, wherever it is promulgated and whoever asserts it, it doesn't require that we adopt another person's solution for solving the problems of this world. But it does require we reject seeing the other as an enemy, as less than human. Simply because, as the author says, Christ has taken those far off and brought us near through his body, through the cross. This is why the author says, so then, you who were once strangers and aliens, you are citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief 
cornerstone. With Christ as our cornerstone, we, we, you and me, can be agents of reconciliation. Amen.